Hey guys, Ritter 31 Lane here again. Um, after doing our video on infiltration and keeping with our historical tactics and our classical tactics, uh, we're going to talk today about salience and attacking and defending salience in a, a modern sense and in a historical sense. Because one, not only is this the stuff that I have a huge passion for, but you know, growing up, a lot of times when you see this stuff in history class, you see movies and things, nobody ever takes the time to explain to you what a salient actually is. They just say, hey, you're going to attack you know, the salient at Kursk. So going over some terminology, just kind of getting some general stuff out there. So on its head, basically a salient is a protrusion in the front line um, that can be caused by one of a couple of ways. So the most common way um, associated with that is an attacking force is attacking and they meet much more resistance on the two flanks than they do in this center area and so they're able to advance further before they actually stop. So now you have this massive protrusion into the line. Right, another way that this happens is if this force is retreating or getting driven back but this area has hardened positions and is offering much more resistance so now while the wings may be getting pushed back they're able to stay in place. Okay, so the opposite side of that equation is the re-entrant. So when you are the side that has the salient pointing into your line, your line is called a re-entrant. Right, so salients mean a couple of things. So one, salients are always obvious choices for attack because they can be attacked from three positions, straight on and from the two wings. And they're also very bad positions for the enemy to have in their lines because if you look if I have forces here and I have forces here and I want to supply them, I cannot take a direct route to move troops, to move supplies, or anything like that. So I have a very long line of supply around there. Whereas the enemy, if he wants to supply troops in either of these two points, he more or less has a very short distance, potentially a straight line between those two. So having that is a huge hole in my line, especially if the salient occupies a town, a railway head, or a major convergence of roads and things like that, where now I may have to go clear out and around to be able to find suitable transportation to get back to my line. So that's why salients are such an inviting target. So the general gist of attacking a salient is to hit the salient from the two wings with two pincer movements moving together, converging behind the line, sealing off the salient, and eventually destroying them either in a battle of annihilation or through a siege or some other method like that. So now, in and of itself seems very simple, um, but attacking a salient has numerous risks associated. The first and the most obvious one associated with attacking a salient is that they stick out. They're very obvious. You know there's a salient there. The enemy knows there's a salient there. Everybody knows. Um, we take, for example, in the 20th century, the biggest attack into a salient ever in history and the largest land battle ever in history, the Battle of Kursk, Operation Citadel, where the Germans attacked the Russians. The Russians knew not only because of captured intelligence, but because of obviousness, the Kirk salient was massive and took up so much of the front line that it was just such an obvious target that they always had assumed the Germans would attack there. So aside from the obvious, uh, the other problem that we run into is so now, if you imagine when I'm pinching all right, from the edges here with my two pincer movements, and I have to turn my forces here to come behind, all right, I have to expose the flank of my attacking units potentially to a counterattack from the enemy on that side. So without sufficient forces guarding the flank there, the attackers themselves leave themselves wide open for a counterattack, which is then going to push that line way beyond all right, and use that salient all right, almost as a hammer and anvil against them. All right, the other main thing that we're going to run into is the coordination level. So if we do not keep the two pincers that are moving coordinated, we can potentially have a disaster. And this happened to the Russians in World War I and the Battle of the Masurian Lakes when they were fighting the Germans. So what happened is if you know anything about the geography of Western Russia, um, they have a lot of marshes called Pripyats or Pripyats. And so when you come close to the Masurian Lakes, they have basically a natural terrain feature that nobody could make it through. So the Russians in attacking the Germans had a huge numerical advantage, but they were forced to go around uh, these big lakes in there. Now the Germans picked up from communications and from intelligence that the Russians were not even. One of their wings was way out in front of the other. So they were actually able to redeploy their troops, attack one side with overwhelming force, redeploy again, move around, attack the other side with overwhelming force, and defeat both sides even though the Russians had a major advantage up to then. So, attacking the salient is not cut and dried. 
even though they are always prime targets. Prior to World War I, French officers were generally instructed not to attack into salients because of the very danger of exposing the flanks. And so now, kind of the last point that I want to bring home is, in the modern sense, attacking a salient and battles of annihilation have always been the goal ever since the Romans, or, uh, pardon me, ever since the Carthaginians defeated the Romans in the Battle of Cannae, uh, way back in BC 216, I believe, that if you seal off the troops and you can fight these massive battles of annihilation, you can eliminate their armies. But what armies have found out in the modern era is that just creating these massive pockets and destroying them is not enough to defeat an enemy. The Germans were by far the best to do that in the modern era. In the beginning stages of World War II, they surrounded pocket after pocket of Soviet troops and annihilated them. They were killed on average 250,000 Russians a month. Wasn't enough. Couldn't affect the supply, couldn't affect the disposition of communication and equipment for the Russians. So ultimately, they were defeated. Uh, so, once again, just passing some knowledge. Any questions you guys got? Any subjects or any specific battles that maybe you have questions about? Send them on in. Love to answer this stuff. Uh, this is my go-to, my bread and butter right here.